my name's Mark Manson. I'm farming here in Golden Bay on our family farm. I've uh, been here, I was born here, brought up here. Was never going to be a farmer, but came back in the year 2000, so it's 12 years ago now, 13 years ago now. Married uh, my wife Laura 10 years ago, and we have two children. Uh, bought the family farm four years ago now. After share milking, we were 30% share milkers for a start, then 50% share milkers, then bought the farm with my parents' help. And um, here we are. When I, I first came to the farm, we were, it was a 320 cow farm. And just before we became 50-50 share milkers, Dad bought the neighbouring farms. We upped the number of cows up to 520 cows to farm this extra area, which we did for, I think, two years. We were at that number of cows. And then we decided that it was, it was too much strain on the farm. It's a, a dry farm. It dries out a lot in the summer, and it, it was just too much. So we dropped numbers down to 490 cows. Then uh, we moved on to a different farming system and we're back down now to 360 cows and we're actually producing as much as we did with 490 cows. The reason that we do as well with less cows is because we feed them better. It's, it's a simple but, um, but basic thing really, uh, but quite, quite profound in that cows that are fed better make more milk. We um, being a dry farm, we have changed species of grass. We had a very bad drought in the year 2000. And a friend said to me in passing, it just shows the danger of being in a monoculture. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, well, you're only growing rye grass. And I thought about it and thought, well, actually you're right. And it gets really hot here in the summer. Rye grass stops growing when the soil temperature gets around about 20 to 22 degrees. And we quite often have a a month, two months, when the soil temperature is above that temperature. So I looked into planting different species. Uh, we have some paddocks of fescues now and coxfoots. Um, a lot of chicory, plantain planted around the farm, as well as the rye grass and clover. And that was sort of my first step into to changing things. Then I went to a, a conference where there were these speakers that talked about the soil, and I'd never really thought about the soil before. And they talked about how you can change the way that you, you treat the soil, you'll get great, greater root depth. Greater root depth means that when it gets dry, the, the plants have access to more moisture because the moisture's down there. And uh, it's just followed on from there, really. I, I've, I thought that sounds like a great idea. These paddocks along here are one of the areas where we decided to try a different grass species. So we've got a fescue and coxfoot clover mix. Uh, there is also bean plantain and chicory in it, but they've they've done their life cycle. But we planted these because the ryegrass is a monoculture on most of our farms and we get very dry around here. Now this is the middle of summer. Normally this would be a brown expanse because the ryegrass would have stopped growing but these species just hold on. Yeah. This is a uh, chicory and clover paddock from last year that I put an annual ryegrass into which has just died out over this last dry period that we've had. Yeah, I let it go to seed, thinking I'll get a free seeding, and I'm going to drill, direct drill ryegrass into it. It has a really thick clover content in it, and that's part of the, the beauty of doing this, is that as we grow it over the summer, there's the chicory and the clover, which we graze off, we break graze it off as a crop multiple times, and then in the autumn we plant ryegrass. It's good to have some different things, and if we can get the mix right, around the farm, then the cows will be having a good varied diet the entire time and hopefully they'll keep producing good the entire time. What we've done is we've changed our focus from the replacement theory where you theoretically take so many nutrients out of the farm and then you just put them back on as a form of fertiliser. And we've changed our focus to becoming looking at the, the base saturation of the soil, which is focusing on the pH made up of the calcium, magnesium, the potassium and the sodium and getting the ratio of those elements in the soil correct. And then once they're at the correct level then you can focus on trace elements and the soil then begins to work in, in a much better way. It, 
it becomes more resilient. When you have too much moisture, it can absorb it better and, and the soil structure holds together better rather than getting more compressed. We have more worm life. One of our biggest problems was soil compaction, which comes from running too many cows, particularly in the winter. Uh, once you compact soil, you run into issues like thistles love compacted soil, grass doesn't grow so well. If you destroy the soil via pugging, it takes years for it to come back properly. Um, so these are things that we just weren't paying so much attention to, but now that we are, we're actually getting better results. Everything is easier now on the animals, on us. The animals being better fed, they're happier, more contented. And when the animals are happy, we're happy, the, the stress just isn't there. The, the family's happy because we can spend a lot more time with them and not being stressed out, not having to go out and feed out again because we're short of grass. And the cows are, are mooing at the, the fence, they just don't moo at the fence now. We'd always find we'd get into late January and we'd really need to get rid of some cows. We were overstocked, we couldn't feed them properly. But we couldn't get rid of cows yet because we didn't know who was pregnant, who wasn't. There were only a few old cows that we could cull that we knew we weren't going to keep. And we had to wait until late February to pregnancy test the cows so that we could actually destock enough to feed the cows in the summer. The way that we work things now, we farm through the summer. We have enough feed for the, all those cows. Uh, whereas previously, you'd be sweating at this time of the year. I've got to get rid of some cows. I really have to get rid of some. But now it, it doesn't matter at all. It, it's much easier. Dad would look around and he'd go, oh, it doesn't look right. Grass looks hungry to me. It, the, the ground looks hungry. And so he did his own blind tests. And he went around the farm and there were about four different areas where he tied a little bit of string onto a post. And he'd do things like put the equivalent of 300 kg of sulfur super on one a couple of hundred kg of potash on another, some nitrogen on another. And he thought, we'll see a result here. We'll see that Mark's doing things wrong. But nothing happened. We couldn't tell where he put anything on. So obviously nutrients weren't the limiting factor. Our biggest limiting factor is moisture. There's just two of us work here, myself and my employee Jamie. In the spring, Dad rears the calves and does a great job and we employ a, another guy to cover our weekends off. We, we work on a roster of 11 days on, three days off, all year round, including the spring. And so over the spring, that guy comes in every weekend and does, does three days, which is great because all through spring, we just keep having a life. We, keep, we don't work those 50, 60 days that some people do on, in a row. We work 11 days on, three days off, and everything is it's good. You know, we don't get worn out. It's still tiring, the spring is tiring. It's hard work, but there's no point in uh, driving yourself into the ground. I feel like we are doing a biological farming program because it's based on the soil and keeping the soil in its optimum condition the actual structure of the soil, the colour of the soil, the worm numbers, what's growing in the soil, the, the texture, the ground cover, how deep the roots go, the pH. When I look at how grass grows around the place, when I look at the condition of our cows, I feel that it's working. I know that it's working. <laughs>